Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so we are having our second gravitating vortex talk today. Yeah. Mario Garcia Fernandez, who's ready, Mario? Yep, whenever you want. Yep. So, yeah, so he's going to uh, speak on gravitating vortices with positive curvature. Yep. Okay, so thank you very much to to the organizers, to, to Nuno and Susmita for, for the kind uh, invitation. It's a, a real pleasure to, to be giving this, this talk in, in this uh, program in Bangalore, even if it's virtually. I'm sorry for not being in, in person there, but still I hopefully I, I can give you some, some insight on this gravitating body. So this, this work I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Pamsi Pingali, who I believe is in the audience, and Chen Yang Yao, uh, which was published in, in Advances in Mathematics in 2021. Okay, so let's go for, for some background. Even though you are experts, I'm going to recall a few things about Davillian vortices in a way that maybe is not so familiar to, to the audience. So let me start by just recalling what these equations are. So I'm going to consider the, the abelian vortex equation for a Hermitian metric H on a lane bundle over a Riemann surface sigma. Do you see my pointer? Yeah, we see your little hands. We, we can okay, that's, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so this sigma is my Riemann surface, L is the lane bundle, and then I fix this phi, which is a, a holomorphic global section of L. Then these vortex equations are given as follows in terms of the curvature of the Hermitian metric. Here, I mean the, the curvature of the churn connection associated to H, and then uh, this norm squared of, of, the, of the section. Here, there is a, a parameter tau, which typically is called the symmetry breaking parameter. So these equations are a generalization of the equations on R2 that were introduced by Gisbord and Landau in the 50s in the theory of superconductivity. <clears throat> Often these equations are called of uh, Bogomolny equations because they saturate a suitable energy bound. And uh, yeah, they depend on a, on a choice of background metric on the, on the Riemann surface T, which is the one I used to calculate this, this Hodge star. And as I mentioned already, this depends on this parameter tau. So in this, in the physical setup, uh, originally introduced by Gisbur and Landau, the churn connection of the Hermitian metric represents the electromagnetic field, and phi is uh, the wave function density of, of an electron. <clears throat> so abelian vortices, as you, you know, have been studied extensively in the literature, starting with Jaff and, and Taus on the Euclidean plane, and then Witten in, in Miskowski, Minkowski space time in two dimensions. And assuming that sigma is, is compact, the existing problem was completely solved, or Abelian vortices was completely solved by Noguchi, Brado, and Garcia Prada independently. And let me recall the basic result. So let L be a holomorphic element over a, over a compact Riemann surface. So now I'm going to assume that sigma is compact. I fix some background Keller metric G, and I have a non-vanishing section of L. If you fix a parameter tau, then the abelian vortex equation, which I'm going to write this in this way, instead of taking the Hodge star, I trace with the metric, the curvature. Then that means a solution H, if and only if, four pi times the vortex number n, given by the, the integral of the, of the first in class, I mean, by the first in class of the, of the lemma model. Four pi times the vortex number divided by the volume is smaller than the symmetry breaking parameter tau. And in that case, if the solution exists, then it's actually unique. Okay, so far so good. This is like the, the, the prohistory of, of vortices, I guess. So the, the very origins of vortices. And, and uh, I'm going to recall the proof because I really want to, to emphasize 
uh, some aspects that were discovered by Garcia Prada in his PhD thesis. So how do you prove this result? This is Garcia Prada's method. So assume that H is a, is a solution. Then you can integrate the gravity, the vortex equation, the abelian vortex equation. And then when you integrate this bit, you obtain the, the vortex number uh, uh, up to a factor of two pi. And here you obtain some, some positive quantity, the L2 norm of the section. So this, this equality here, which is just cook up out of the of the of the abelian um, vortex equation, then implies automatically that the symmetry breaking parameter tau has to be bigger than this combination of the vortex number and the volume. Okay, so this is the easy part. Assume now that this bound is satisfied, which we know is is, is necessary bound. And now I'm going to consider a, a geometric construction. I'm going to consider a bundle on the product of my Riemann surface cross P1, the Riemann sphere. And this bundle is given by an extension of the pullback of the holomorphic tangent bundle on the P1 and the pullback of L on the other factor. Okay. This actually turns out to be an SU2 equivalent bundle by the natural action of SU2 on P1. And actually, this extension is uniquely determined to isomorphism by the section we have chosen phi. Okay, so if you give me a vortex, if you give me a, a line bundle with, with section on the Riemann surface, then I can automatically cook up this extension and it's well defined. Okay. Then what Garcia Prada showed is that if you choose this particular Keller form on X on the product, given by the pullback of omega, the Keller form of the fixed background metric G, plus this combination of the Fubini study metric on the P1 factor with a, on a factor, on, it, it is rescaled by a factor with depends on, on tau. Then uh, this bundle E is a slope polystable, a slope stable with respect to the class omega tau, if and only if this inequality holds. Okay. And here, a slope stability is in the sense of of uh, the donaldson ullenbeck yao term, if you want, uh, in terms of uh, Manfors, hilbert manfors geometric invariant theory. On the other hand, he also proved that if this bundle admits a Hormitian insane metric, omega tau, as the one appears in the donaldson ullenbeck yao theorem, then uh, this occurs if and only if L admits a solution of the vortex equation one. Okay, and then with this combination of, of results, uh, he reduced the proof to the Donaldson, to the application of the Donaldson Ulenbe Yau theorem in one dimension uh, higher. Okay, so far so good. And any questions about this? This is like the, yes, some background. All good? Okay, Let, don't hesitate to, to interrupt me if you need any clarification. So this result by Braldo, Garcia Prada, and Noguchi is, is very nice. In particular, it identifies what is precisely the modular space of, of abelian vortices on a compact Riemann surface, which is given by the symmetric product of the surface n times, or n is the vortex number. So this modular space carries a very interesting Keller metric, which is obtained via infinite dimensional Keller reduction, similarly as, as you obtain the Keller metric on the modular space of solutions of the Hermite and Mills equations. And this has been extensively studied in the literature uh, by Manton, Nuno Romao, Baptista, and many other people. In 2011, I was attending a, a program on modular spaces similar to this one in, in Cambridge. And I attended this, this lecture by, by Nick Manton. And he mentioned in his talk about abelian vortices that he was going to assume all over his talk that the vortices had no bar reaction on the metric on the surface. So he, he, he was saying that this means that there are no gravity, there are not gravitational, so there are no gravitational effects. But he also mentioned that actually some vortices, uh, often called cosmic strings, have a gravitational effect. So at the time I was in the audience, I was a young postdoc, I got interested into 
this question. I was uh, visiting Cambridge Jolie with my former supervisors, Garcia Prada and Alvarez Consul, and uh, we we thought that we could have a, some insight on what is the right notion of gravity in vortices in, in mathematics. So this is what I, I'm going to tell you now. So the question I would like to address is on the one hand, which equation describes gravity in vortices mathematically? And a question maybe for the future, what is the structure of its of its model aspects? Okay, so let me go for the for these gravitating vortices. What we what do we mean by that? Okay. So at the time I was studying some equations in which I introduced in my in my PhD thesis, jointly with Alvarez Consul and Garcia Prada, called the Keller Young Mills equations. And uh, what we do, what we did, I'm going to explain this, is to do some dimensional reduction similar to, to the one that I explained in the in the theorem by, by Garcia Prada to obtain these equations that I'm going to present now out of dimensional reduction of, of these Keller Young Mills equations in higher dimension. So let me go for, for this thing. So what is for us and in the rest of this talk a gravity thin vortex? So I'm going to fix a holomorphic line bundle over a Riemann surface sigma. I'm going to fix a section of L, which I'm going to assume to be non-zero. I fix tau as before, and I fix some constant alpha, which secretly is going to be like the gravitational constant. Then the gravitating vortex for a pair GH, now the metric on the surface, which is scalar, is actually an unknown. It's not fixed, it's not background. Then the scalar metric on sigma and H, and Hermitian metric on L, uh, must satisfy these these two equations. So the first one is just the familiar abelian vortex equations, and then the second one is a scalar equation which couples the scalar curvature of my kilometric on the surface plus this quantity which depends on the norm squared of the of the of the phi. Okay, and involves it's, this is actually a, a differential operator. This is the Laplacian. With respect to the metric. Okay. This constant, this constant C, which appears on the on the right hand side of the equations, is, is topological and is given explicitly by this uh, uh, number here. Essentially it's written down in terms of the scalar curvature, uh, sorry, on the on the Euler characteristic of the surface and this combination of the of the parameters for scale by, by the volume. Okay, any question on the equations? I'm going to recall the equations many times in my slides, so don't worry. Okay, let me go on. So let me summarize how how did we obtain these equations because conceptually it's very important for for, it, for me and, and for the rest of this talk. So what we did is precisely mimic the, the construction that Garcia Prada did. So we consider the HU2 equivalent bundle on the product of the Riemann surface cross the Riemann sphere determined by this section phi as before. This is a holomorphic extension of the tangent bundle on the P1 by, by L. Then with these fixed parameters, the gravity in the vortex equations emit a solution with scalar for omega if and only if X, which is this complex surface where it is here, sigma plus P1, admits an E, this bundle, which is an extension, admits a solution of these other equations in higher dimensions, which we call the Keller Young Mills equations. So the first one is just the Hermite Einstein equation for the metric on the bundle E, which is now non abelian. We are in rank two. And this other equation couples the scalar curvature of the, of the Keller metric on, on X with this other quantity, which is like a, you trace two times with respect to the metric of this uh, Pontryagin term coming from the bundle. Ah, uh, yeah. And the, there is an explicit prescription of what is the, Keller metric on, on X, if you have the solution of the of these gravity in vortex equations, which is precisely as in Garcia Prada's term. Okay, so why are we interested in these other equations? This is not going to appear anymore in my talk, but the only thing I wanted to, to mention is that the way we got to these equations is purely mathematical and actually is via some moment map construction in infinite dimensions, similar to the atilla bot donaldson construction for the Hermite-Young-Mills equations, okay? So the upshot 
of this interpretation by dimensional reduction is that uh, the gravitating vortex equations automatically have a moment map interpretation uh, as well. Okay, and I'm going to systematically use this in my talk. Okay, let me move on. So something special happens with C equals to zero, which shows that these equations are not just made up. It's actually, equations actually in the case C equals to zero, they relate to physics, to these gravitating vortices that, that Manton was talking in his 2011 talk. So when C equals to zero, the, the constant which appears here, then in this case, because of the explicit formula we have for C, the Riemann surface sigma must be P1, and the parameter alpha must be this particular condition, one over tau times the vortex angle. Then in this case, the equations are actually equivalent to the self-dual Einstein maxwell hiss equations, which appear in describing phase transitions in the early universe in, in cosmology. So what are these equations? So these equations are particular solutions of the Einstein equations in four dimensions, coupled with an electromagnetic field and a Higgs field. And the geometry is sigma cross R2, where in the R2 factor I put a flat mean Minkowski metric. Okay, so you, you consider this ansatz plus a bunch of several other constraints, and you find this particular solution of the Einstein constraints coupled with an electromagnetic field and a heat field. So as I mentioned, one important thing conceptually, and this physically, uh, uh, an important difference between these equations here and the abelian vortex equation is that the interpretation of, of phi is different. Here, phi is a Higgs field, while in the abelian vortex equation is like the uh, uh, wave function for the for the electron. Okay, so okay, so the, the way you produce this this type of solutions of Einstein equations coupled with matter are via the so-called Kibel mechanism. So in the most extended uh, theory for, for gauge fields, they say the standard model, the Higgs field takes a particular value in the universe. But the uh, will propose that this value may vary from, from regions in the, in the universe to other regions. Uh, and then because of this particular choice of, of potential for the, for the Higgs field, then when you, when you are in low energies, the phi must decay to, to some uh, ground state, and this breaks the symmetry. And because of the topology of space-time, then at some regions or at some particular points in the, in, in the space-time, you may have, again, high energy configuration. So you may not, your topology of the space-time may not allow your, your Higgs field to be at the ground state for, for in, in all the universe, and you obtain these this high energetic configurations, which corresponds to these solutions. So when there is no matter, so if there is no uh, uh, Maxwell electromagnetic field, neither Higgs field, this, this uh, cosmic strings were studied for, for a long time. Actually, in the original paper by Conte and Gibbons, they show that there was this type of cosmic string solutions of the Einstein equations with pure gravity. And the nice feature of these things are these are conical metrics. And the deficit angle of the, I mean, the angle of the cone corresponds to some deficit angle, uh, which can be measured theoretically with an experiment. So the, this is, it has observable effects using light. Okay. Okay. So this is as for the physical motivation of this gravitating vortex equations. I don't know if there are any questions about this part. Okay, so if not, let me move to the mathematical results. So this was just some background and some motivation. So what can we say about existence for C non-negative? Non I'm oh, sorry, for C non-positive. So the first thing is that these equations can be reduced to a PDE, actually to a system of PDE for two functions on the surface. So if you take two functions UF on the Riemann surface, 
which I'm going to assume to be compact, and consider this metric for some background metric G0 fixed, and this uh, formation metric for some background formation metric uh, fixed H0. Then the gravity in vortex equations for GH are equivalent to this system of, of PD. Okay, so this, this is a system of PD which involves these Laplacian terms and some very nonlinear terms of order zero. So the first thing we can prove about this is in collaboration with Alvarez Consul, Garcia Prada and Pingali in this paper in Mazanalen, we show in the result that if you have a compact connected Riemann surface with genus bigger equal than two, then there exists a solution of the gravitating vortex equations with fixed volume two pi say, provided that this bound of alpha is, is satisfied. And of course, with this choice of volume, this is just the, the usual um, inequality for, for abelian vortices. Okay, I, I didn't mention, but uh, I mentioned it in the, in the impasse, but uh, alpha in this physical picture about cosmic strings has the interpretation of the um, Einstein uh, gravitational constant. So say that for for when, in the in the regime where where the where the gravity is weak, we can solve the the equations actually with this particular ball. Okay. So assume now that c equals to zero. This is the the, the physical case, the relation with cosmic strings to these self-dual einstein maxwell scales equations. In this case, just because of the definition of the, of the parameter C, sigma must be P1 because two alpha tau one n are positive and alpha must be one over tau times the vortex number n. And in this case, if you take a look on the previous system, something funny happens. So this C vanishes, this C vanishes, and then you can actually um, obtain U from the F, and then you reduce to a single, to a single PD. Okay, using this fact, actually uh, Ji Song Yang, in a series of papers, and more recently Han and Son, prove the following existence result. So assume that you have an effective divisor on P1 given by multiplicities Ni and a bunch of points Pi on P1 corresponding to your pair L phi. So this, this divisor is the divisor corresponding to the vanishing locus of phi and the Ni's are the multiplicities. <coughs> so assume that any of the individual multiplicities is smaller than the vortex number divided by two. Then for sufficiently big volume, this is what he says. So if you have V bigger than the, the use of bone, then there exists a solution of the self one estimate of his equation says that the volume is bigger than this V. So I say that so for sufficiently volume, for sufficiently high volume, large volume, you obtain solutions. And then the second case is say the, the, the symmetric case. Assume that your divisor has only two points and that the multiplicities are precisely the vortex number divided by two. Then the equations admit a solution on any Keller class such that the volume is bigger than four pi n divided by tau. And in this case, actually, the solution is just one symmetric. So if you have two points, uh, the divisor is given by two points, you can choose coordinates that they are located at the north and south pole, and then this is one is uh, the natural rotational symmetry of the sphere with respect to the north-south uh, uh, pole points. Okay. Any question? Okay. So this is just the theorem again. So you don't need to. If you read it, you don't need to read it again. If you didn't, you can read it again. So let me just explain Yang's method. So what, how does this mysterious inequality appears in, from his point of view? This is a purely analytical uh, fact from his point of view. So what, what Yang considers is a rescale PD for some parameter epsilon 
and a suitable choice of, of metric. And then he chooses the background metric to be one over epsilon G naught. So taking epsilon small is like taking the, the, the volume to be very large. And then he obtains this PDE, which is just a change of variables. But instead of looking at norm phi squared, for him, the, um, say, the, the important quantity is the log of phi squared. So this is, of course, singular at the points where, where phi vanishes. So by smoothing out this quantity, he is able to obtain a sequence of, of super solution of this, of this PDE. And then in order to prove that this sequence of super solutions converges to an actual solution of the equations, he needs to prove a, a C0 estimate. And this requires some LP bound on the norm of phi of H0 squared powers to minus one over n. Okay, and this is the way so you can do the calculation. This condition here is precisely the condition on the multiplicities, on the individual multiplicities of of the, of the section five. And two just reduces to one, to one of the. Okay, so. Mario, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the Laplacian of U has to be pointwise always smaller than one? Sorry, can you say it again? The Laplacian of U has to be pointwise always smaller than one. I mean, the, this is the multiplicative this is the metric you're choosing, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is a yeah. So you. So is that automatic that that you satisfies that condition or? I mean. No, no. You need to you need to impose. So I oh, no 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 no. Okay. So let me. It appeared before. No 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 no. Yeah yeah no. So it it just follows from this. It just follows from this thing. So one minus the Laplacian is the exponential of this thing. So it is automatically. I see. I see. Okay. So one is to, to be one is to be a bit careful about the the actual average of of u, but this is this follows from this other equation. So you take a u solving this PD with c equals to zero, and then you need to be a bit careful. So this is actually yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think this is yeah. You don't need to to be careful about the even the integral. Yeah, it's just you take a solution of this uh, PD with c equals zero, and this is automatically the exponential of the equation. Yeah, is it clear or yes? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the the U which appears here is uh, all the time solving the the PD. In the other thing. But in the end, you reduce to to this uh, to this PD, which in, for which you don't have any any dependence on you. Okay, so you just reduce it to to this thing, and whenever you have a solution to this f, this is going to be your your metric solving the, the this self dual Einstein Maxwell his equation rescaled by the parameter f. Okay. Okay. So if you know a little bit of algebraic or complex geometry, then you may have recognized these conditions appearing in Yang's theorem and Hanson theorem as a, a man for GIT stability condition for the action of SL2C on, on the symmetric power of P1. So if you if you give me a, a bunch of points with multiplicities on the Riemann sphere on P1, then the SL2C action naturally acts there and there is a um, there is a natural numerical condition for this point to appear in the GIT quotient by of SNP1 by the SL2C action. And this is either the divisor is stable, and in this case, the individual multiplicities has to be smaller than the total uh, vortex number divided by two, or you are in the strictly polystable case, and in this case, you have only two points in the support and the multiplicities are equal to half of the uh, total vortex number. Okay, so a partial converse of, of this uh, result by, by Yang was proved uh, by Albert Consul, myself, Garcia Prada, Pingali, and later independently with, in a collaboration with, with Chen Yang Zhao. 
and it states the following. So assume that you have tau alpha in R and assume that your divisor has support given by exactly two points. And this corresponds to the parallel phi. Then assume that this configuration, the Riemann sphere L and this particular phi, vanishing and these two points, admits a solution of the gravity temporal vortex equation, then the following holds. So the first one is just the, the usual uh, vortex inequality. So there is nothing new. I just stated here because what I want to mention before, maybe later. And the new information is that this D must be polystable with respect to the SL2C action on the symmetric product of P1. That is, the two individual multiplicities must be equal to the total vortex number divided by two. And the, the method of proof is interesting. It actually comes from this uh, moment map interpretation of the gravity in vortex equation, which utterly goes uh, to the moment map interpretation of these Keller and Mills equations that I, I was mentioning at the beginning of my talk. So what you do is to cook up an invariant that in the Keller instinct theory is called the Futaki invariant for uh, associated to a triple Riemann surface line bundle and section. And this Futaki invariant is a character of the Lie algebra of automorphisms of this guy. And provided that there exists a solution, this Futaki invariant needs to vanish. So this is similar, very similar to the original invariant uh, obtained by Futaki for the Keller instinct theory. And actually, one can prove that there exists this very clean formula for the Futaki invariant, evaluated on suitable vector fields. And yeah, because of this bound is satisfied, this quantity is positive, and the vanishing, the existence of solutions gives you the vanishing of, of the Futaki invariant, and this gives you precisely that the multiplicities of the of the zeros need to be the total vortex number divided by, by two. Okay. Good. Any questions? Okay, so I, I should mention something which has been tormenting uh, me and us for over one year and a half, which is that in the original proof in 2021, there is a gap. And actually, we claim something much more stronger than this theorem. So the theorem, as, as, as I stated now, is correct. But the, the, in the 2021 paper, we claim that the polystability of D holds with arbitrary support. Okay, and, and the proof what is wrong. There is a, 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 a gap that cannot be filled. We, we reject this term again, the one I have stated. So this is why I'm saying that this is totally correct. We reject this term again in, in collaboration with, with Zhao in this publication in, in Bulletin de Sciences Mathematiques. So this is this is fine. And thanks to, to a collaboration with, with Shen Yang Yao and the hard work mainly of Bamsi Pingali and, and Yao on their analytical muscle, we are we believe now that a complete proof of the general case with the arbitrary is is now within reach. Okay. But this more general theorem, which uh, I bet now is is correct, we are not going to use it. I just need this this uh, weaker term, which is actually 100% uh, sure. Okay. Okay. This was the, the difficult moment in my talk. That's fine. Let's go ahead. So existence for for uh, C bigger than, than zero. So this is the case of positive curvature. So, so far we have seen some results in the uh, C is more or equal than zero case. Let's see what happens in the C bigger than zero case. So I'm going to assume now that alpha is bigger than zero and the constant C is bigger than zero as well. This is the constant which appears in this gravity temperature equation. Okay. So this case is more difficult because these equations, when you reduce it to, to, to a scalar PD, is a system. It's not a single PD. Okay. Still, because of these uh, conditions here, the topology is actually the one of the two sphere, and alpha is going to be given by, by this power. Okay. Then, in a publication in, in two years ago in advanced yeah. mathematics with Pingali and Zhao, we can prove the following. 
So assume that you have an effective device around P1 corresponding to the per L5 and fix tau and alpha says that this bound is satisfied. So, so that C is bigger than zero. This just means that C is bigger than zero, okay? Assume that D, the divisor on P1 corresponding to, to this phi is SL2C polystable. So either the individual multiplicities are smaller than the total vortex number divided by two, or D has only support given by two points with equal multiplicities. Then the gravity time vortex equation, these ones, admit a solution with coupling constant alpha for any Keller class such that the volume is bigger than four pi n divided by tau. Okay, so this completely solves the equation, the, the question of how, I mean, when do you have uh, gravitating vortices on, on, a, on a Riemann surface with positive constant C? Actually, one can prove a, a, a posteriori, and this is part of, of the estimates that we do for, for our theorem, that this, I mean, the curvature of the vortex, I mean, the curvature of the, of the metric on the Riemann surface is actually bounded by, by this C. And therefore, we call this positive curvature case. So this is very similar to, to the first in class positive, so to the Fano case in the Keller Einstein, in the Keller Einstein theory. Okay, so this is just a statement. What about the proof? Okay, so the idea to prove this term, this is just the same term, so that you don't have to read it again. So the, the idea is to apply the continuity method in the parameter alpha, starting from young solution for alpha one over tau n. So this is the case of C equals to zero related to this cosmic string equations. Okay, so this case was solved by, by Jan. And then we want to do a continuity method in, in the parameter alpha. There are some difficulties though. On the one hand, Jan result, as I mentioned before, only holds for very large volume when D is different, uh, or it's, it's not the, 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 <coughs> the strictly polystable divisor. Another difficulty is if we have S1 symmetry, so in the symmetric case, this potentially obstructs openness in alpha when we have this symmetric configuration form. And the other thing is that in order to apply the continuity method, one needs to, to take, to prove closeness. And for that, one needs to rule out the formation of singularities on a sequence of solutions taking alpha k to some uh, value alpha naught of the of the parameter. Okay, so these are the three difficulties. So let me mention how we overcome this. So the first difficulty is actually the the most difficult one to overcome. It's actually related to to the last one. Okay, so the young result only holds for for this volume force forces us in order to solve completely the problem of existence to prove or to enhance or to, to extend Young's result to, to arbitrary volume. So the first thing we do is for the case of this cosmic string equation, so this cell dual instance maxwell here equation, we prove that uh, the equations admit a solution for any admissible volume. So you have a, an effective device around P1 corresponding to L5, assume that this is stable. So all the multi individual multiplicities are smaller than the total vortex number divided by two. Then, this self dual Einstein Maxwell Hiss equation corresponding to gravity time vortices with C equals to zero and is the same as alpha equals to this. Then admit a solution for any Keller class that the volume is bigger than, than the bound. Okay. So the, the idea for proving this is a little different from, from the other term. Instead of starting with Young solution and deforming alpha, what we do is start with Young solution with large volume and they continue, apply the continuity method to the parameter of the volume, okay? And again, for this thing, we, we go back to this difficulty I mentioned before of taking uh, <clears throat> sequences of, of solution and proving that singularities are, are not formed along the solutions. Okay, so instead of talking about this term, the, the proof of this is very similar to, to the proof of, of the case C bigger than zero. I'm going to to give you a hint on how we prove the, the first result, okay? So this, this result here, the case C bigger than zero. Okay, so what happens with this openness problem, the, the case 
of S1 symmetry. So in, in that case, we can prove the following. So if we have an effective device around P1 corresponding to L5, assume that this poly is stable with respect to the SL2C action, then the existence of gravitating vortices is an open condition for alpha. So we can prove that this potential obstruction coming from the S1 symmetry is not, is not there. So when this is stable, this is very simple. It's just the application of, of the implicit function theorem. In the S1 symmetric case, what one needs to do is to apply a lebrun simanka type theorem, type argument. So this is uh, this theorem is uh, actually proof uh, independently in, in my work with Alvarez Consul and Garcia Prada and, and later reproof in this case for 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 the gravitating vortex equations with Pingali and, and Zhao. So given a solution of the gravitating vortex equations with alpha positive, if you have an nearby alpha prime, then instead of solving the gravitating vortex equations, what you can solve are some weaker equations that we call extremal pairs. So without going into details, what I'm going, all, all I want to say about this is that these are uh, analog, these extremal pairs are analog to extremal metrics in the killer Einstein theory. So it means that out of the unknowns of the equation, suppose that you, you have a, a, a omega, I mean, a metric on the, on the, on the surface and a, and a little h, out of this uh, unknown, so you have one given solution, then nearby the solution and for nearby alpha prime, you can find another metric on the, on the surface and another metric on the bundle, says that out of the quantities which appear in equations, the scalar curvature, this uh, abelian vortex term, you can cook up a vector field in the test space of the line bundle, and this vector field is holomorphic. This is essentially the, the extremal condition. And extremal pairs have a very natural, have a very nice property, which is that if you have an extremal pair and the Futaki invariant vanishes, then this is actually a solution. And because we have this result that states that if there exists a solution, in a symmetric configuration, then the Futaki invariant vanishes. Then we can prove this that this extremal pair is actually uh, a gravitating vortex. Okay, so this solves the, the openness in general. Okay, so things get much more complicated for proving closed nets. So in order to prove closed nets and rule out singularities, when we take a sequence of of values of the of the parameter alpha, we need the following. So firstly, we need a new form of equations written in a more Riemannian way. So what we prove is that if you give me a tuple given by a Riemann surface, a line bundle, and a section, a metric which is scalar on the on the surface and H, a Hermitian metric on the line bundle, then solving the gravity in vortex equations with with a um, zero genus so on, 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 with, with topology S2 is equivalent to a pair to a triple G eta phi. So that G is a metric on S2. Eta is a smooth, is a smooth closed real two form on S2, which has this integral. And phi is a non negative function, which we call the state function. Which is vanishing precisely at the pjs, and says that the log of phi is uh, locally in L1, it's locally integral. <clears throat> and this needs to satisfy this Riemannian version of the gravity ten vortex uh, equation. So uh, these two equations are very similar to, to, the, to the gravity ten vortex equations I showed you. Just if you do the, the change of variables that phi is the norm of, of the little phi squared and eta is the curvature of the Hermitian metric on the line bundle. And this other equation is some structural equation which applying Poncarelli long term tells you that this data actually comes from a holomorphic structure on a line bundle with section and these conditions hold. Okay. But the, the new feature about this equation is that this is now a distributional equation with deltas located at the vanishing of phi. Okay. Okay, so using this, this Riemannian version of the system, we prove some a priori estimates 
for the solutions on the one hand is uh, this density phi is bounded by tau and the total integral is tau minus 2n and these two are the most important ones on the one hand the scalar curvature of the solution of this Riemannian version of gravity in vortices is bounded by c this is what we call this positive curvature case and by this particular combination of alpha and tau and also uh, we have a, an estimate on this uh, combination of uh, I mean, on the Laplacian of, of phi, which you can also write in this form in terms of, of tau and, and c. Okay. <clears throat> so using this, we can prove the following proposition, and this is the key to the existing result. So assume that you have a sequence of solutions of this Riemannian gravity thin vortex equation with alpha n going to, to alpha zero. And this alpha zero being between zero and the one over tau n. Then what you can prove is that there exists a sequence of uh, holomorphic automorphisms. So it points in SL2C for a suitable complex structure on the two sphere. So that the pullback of this sequence by this a sequence of, of automorphisms actually converges in C1 beta sense to a smooth solution of the Riemannian gravity in the vortex with constant alpha zero. And a divisor, which is in the SL2C orbit of the given uh, D. So if, if I give you this, then you are done because what happens is that now you can pull back, this is in the SL2C orbit, and then you can pull back and out of this limit, you can obtain a solution on the original on the original uh, for the original device okay and this gives you closeness one technicality which i i think I, I, or i would like to mention because it's related to to this gap that we had in in the math and LM paper is that what this really gives you if you go into the proof is that this this device at infinity is only on the closure of the sl2c orbit of of the and in order to prove that the infinity is actually in the SL2C orbit and not only on the closure, it is enough to know it for the poly, for the strictly polystable case. So it is enough to, to know it for the case which we have a, a complete proof. And this is because of the specific uh, features of the of the Riemann Hill of the Hilbert von criterion in the case of P1. So if, if I give you a divisor which is in the closure of the SL2C orbit, and uh, then if it is not in the orbit, what happens is that it is the limit of under a one parameter subgroup. But if this is the case, then this divisor has support two points. And since we know that there exists a solution for this divisor uh, given by the sequence, then this divisor needs to be strictly polystable. But in the closure of an SL2C orbit, there is only one polystable point. So it means that this actually needs to be in the orbit rather than in the closure. Okay, so this this is the the what, what completes the proof. So in the last, uh, what, what I have two minutes or yes, about let's say three minutes, but we okay. are also let's, flexible. No, no, no. I, I I have only two slides. I just wanted to give you a hint on what you you need to prove. So this follows from from So what you need to do is to apply the a priori estimates I showed you before to prove a, a bone on the on the volume along the sequence, which is given by this thing, and also a bone on the diameter of the sequence of metrics. <clears throat> then you also need to apply relative volume comparison to a bone the, the volume ratio from below, like this. And then by Chike Gromov Taylor, we also have an estimate on the injectivity radius of, of, the, of the family of metrics on, on the two sphere, which is independent of n. So combining all these results and uniform bounds on the scalar curvature and the higher derivatives of the scalar curvature along the sequence, then the statement follows by, by Chike Gromov compactness. So the Chike Gromov compactness tells you that under all these conditions, then your sequence of metrics is not going to converge, but actually um, 
it's going to converge up to pullback by a sequence of, of different morphisms, which is controlled in, in C1 beta norm. And one of the, say, technicalities or difficulties is that a priori, what Chike Gromov tells you is that this sequence of different morphisms is only, uh, they are only smooth. And they are not holomorphic. They are not compatible a priori with the, with the complex structure. And one needs to apply a slicer for complex structure in order to show that you can actually rigidify this family of different morphisms to make it a family of elements in SL2C. And this, this completes the proof. Okay. This comment is about the technicality that actually the family of, of metrics that we need to consider in order to obtain the estimates is more complicated. It's, it's rescaling of, of, of the given sequence by a, by a suitable quantity, but let me ignore that. Okay, so thank you. That's all. Any questions for Mario? Comments on the talk? So uh, maybe I, can, I have a question. Um, so you, uh, yeah, using this Futaki invariant that was presented as an obstruction to, yeah, existence of gravitating mm -hmm. vortices. But then at some point you said that you used the Futaki invariant for to prove existence of something which was kind of intermediate, these ex extremal gravitating vortices, right? Extremal yeah. Pairs. Extremal pairs, sorry, yeah. Yeah. So this seems a bit uh, strange that, you know, this is an obstruction, then you're using it to... Uh, show existence of something, right? Maybe you can, yeah, you did not give too much detail about these external pairs, but can you just give some kind of, uh, yeah, uh, sketch of how the, how the Futak invariant is used in this? In this yeah, let, let me go, let me simplify and forget about the line bundle and the section and so on, and just go to the keller Einstein case. What, what does it mean to be extremal? Extremal, or Keller metric means that the scalar curvature is the potential of a Hamiltonian holomorphic vector field. Okay. And now you have, if, if I give you an extremal metric, Keller metric, in particular, you have a holomorphic vector field. The Keller metric is going to be constant scalar curvature precisely when this holomorphic vector field vanishes. Now, assume further that the complex structure is such that the Futaki invariant vanishes. The Futaki invariant is a character of the Lie algebra of automorphism. So you can evaluate the Futaki invariant on holomorphic vector fields. So now you can use your preferred formula for the Futaki invariant, there are various, but one is very simple and is written in terms of the scalar curvature. So if you evaluate, if you have an extreme offer, if you have an extreme metric, and you evaluate the Futaki on the scalar curvature, thought of as the potential of a holomorphic vector field, then what this gives you is the L2 norm of the difference between the scalar curvature and the average. So if the Futaki invariant vanishes, Therefore, the scalar curvature needs to be constant. Okay. So this is the, the idea. So the idea is that if you a priori know that the Futaki invariant vanishes, then any extreme upper is going to be automatically a solution. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any any more questions or no? Uh, okay. So maybe uh, is there any any developments uh, related to uh, the non-abelian situation where you have vortices like non-abelian so high rank oh yeah so you should talk to to uh, oscar and to jesus aguado who i believe are there in the in the audience and i think they they, they have made some some progress on that i i believe also uh, luis uh, probably mentioned something in his talk even though I was not present because I was, uh, as you said, dipping my, my churros in the chocolate. Um, but uh, 
it was too early in the morning sorry <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Luis but, uh, was yeah. struggling. He he gave a very detailed talk that he was struggling with the time at the end somehow. But, uh, okay. So anyway, so they, in, uh, what, yes, what it's is... true that yeah, we we have here Oscar and Oscar was saying that maybe there was something some interest on this uh, high rank. Oh yeah. So on the, on the one hand, all the general theory about the scalar Young Mills equations in principle applies. Just because these non abelian gravitating vortices also admit a moment map interpretation and it follows like within the same framework, theoretical framework, and all these, all the results that we had in this geometry and topology paper back in the days of my thesis apply. And so you have all these obstructions, Matsushima, Lichner, Wither, and blah, blah. And on the, on the other hand, and this, Cases are, I believe, very interesting to physics. Actually, some of the not and un, 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 unsolved or open questions in this in this theory of cosmic strings have to do with these non-abelian vortices. So I, I haven't done any progress myself on the non-abelian case. I confess, I don't know if Bamsi maybe or or Chen Jian have done anything, and, and I know for sure that Jesus Aguado and and Oscar Garcia Prada are making nice progress on that. So, so it should be it should be them to you should talk to. Thank you. Okay, so no more questions or no. So let's thank uh, uh, Mario again. Thank you, and sorry for for not being there. We were having very nice. Yeah, I hope to, you, to yeah, we are enjoying a very sunny weather here. Yeah, yeah here it's cold, but it's fine. It's sunny. <laughs> thank you very okay, much so thank you Nuno thank you all of you too for, for coming